Right, it's four o'clock. Uh, up next, we will have Zach be presenting Debian in the Dark Ages of Free Software. Hello, is it working? Can you hear me? Better. So, hello, everyone. Welcome again to DabConf, I guess. It's a great pleasure to be back again at, some, at one DabConf and a great honor to be doing one of the opening talk. I confess I wasn't really expecting that honor. I just wanted to propose a session which was supposed to be a kind of a self-head session for those of us that think that there, is, there are some worries to be had about the, where the free software movement is going in general and the role that distributions have to play in the current state of affairs. So this talk will be about a couple of journeys at once. So the first journey is sort of a journey through emotions, through good feelings about what we have achieved in free software over the past 15 to 20 or 30 years, depending how long you've been involved. And the second journey is essentially my own journey through software freedom from the day I started discovering free software and what I've ended up doing since then. So. Starting with the, the positive news, so this is, how, this is how I got involved myself in free software in 1997. I understand that there are people in the room that would have been involved since way earlier than that, others that have been involved since way later than that. Well, that's my story. I hope you'll find resonant points with your own story. And when I started as a freshman in a computer science class in the University of, Bo the University of Bologna, that was a huge tipping point, a huge hype point for the so-called open source movement. That was the year the very influential essay by Eric Raymond has been published. That was the year, well, actually a few months earlier than Netscape decided to open source its, its own code. And that was the moment in the history of free software where people were trying to, to sell to the industry what free software was doing. And I'm not using that word in a cell in a, in a bad sense. So there was reasonable concerns that without the involvement of the industry, the free software movement was a, would have haven't got far. So they were trying to uh, tell about free software in an industry-friendly way. So essentially the rhetoric at the point was that if you do development of, free, of software in the free software way, in a more open way, in a more participative way, you will end up having better software and that by merely opening up your code, you will have these flocks of programmers coming to your project and end up helping you. So a few years later, I realized that I personally didn't believe much in that idea. It's not that only because the software is open is going to be better, but it was a fair thing to try at the time. What I discovered a bit later is actually what stuck in me was essentially the, the philosophy of free software. The fact that computer users should be in charge and in control of their own machine, they should have some basic freedom. So you all know about the four freedoms, so I'm not going to, going to repeat them here, but the, my personal point is there is that the, the way the narrative of free software is something that resonated with me a lot at the time. As a student, I realized that by having free software at my fingertip, as a computer science student, I could debug any single layer of the software stack and look at how things are going. I didn't have to trust the teacher on how a operating system should be developed. I could could be, I was able to open up sched.c in the Linux kernel and have a look at the actual uh, scheduling algorithm that, was in, in, that had been implemented in a real kernel. Not that I really got all of it at the time, but the possibility was just breathtaking for me. And later on, I ended up distilling the main intuition of free software, which is the one I use to explain free software to people, which is the intuition of control. So I ended up believing that the main reason why I've been involved in this movement for about 15 years is that I really believe that every single computer user, and that's a lot of people these days, should be in control over their own computations. So everything you are doing with a device which is mediated via software is controlled by someone. Either it is you or it is someone else. And the best episode, the best narrative to explain that to people that they've been using for quite a while is this passage from the novel Makers by Cory Doctor, which is a bit long, so I'm not going to read in detail. But essentially, there is one character of the novel, which is Lester, which is explaining to another character the importance of controlling your own devices, your own tools. And the first example it takes is the example of a hammer, a physical hammer. And he goes on saying that if you own a hammer, essentially you could do whatever you want with it. You can use it for its main purpose, 
or you can use for something completely different, which was not meant to be its original purpose, but it's you that decide. And it compares that with another device, which is a Disney in a box in the novel, and Disney in this book is the, the big, the evil villain which is oppressing people. And uh, essentially, uh, Disney in a box is a glorified 3D printer that can only print that can only print what Disney wants it to print for that day. So one day it will print uh, a goofy character, another day it will print uh, Donald Duck, but it's not you who decides. It's Disney that decides what the printer is going to print for you that day. You own the device, but you're not in control of what the device does. And the, the big quote for me is that if you don't control your life, you're miserable. And this notion of essentially oppression is what has been motivating me for all these years. So the fact that if you are not in control of your own computation, then someone is oppressing you. Someone usually is the person or the company or whatever that has created that software, that has the power to change that software instead of you. And this is something that really sunk in me. And what was I doing at the time with my computer? Well, I was doing some pretty standard stuff. I was using some of the hardware that we had at the time, which was mostly desktops and local network servers. I didn't have a laptop because it was really expensive for students, so I did get a laptop much later. And I was doing some content production, some content consumption. The kind of content I did produce at the time was mostly uh, office suites, desktop publishing, and this kind of stuff. I was doing some communication, some emails, some IRC, some news group, which was very cool at the time for geek communities. And I was doing some software development as a newbie, but that was what I was doing at the time. I also did some content consumption. So some gaming, which arguably is content that someone else is producing for you to, cons to consume. I was doing some web browsing. The internet was not as popular as it is today, but there was some website you could uh, find it interesting. So in that situation, with that kind of computing, the actual path to software freedom and to control was fairly clear. It was difficult, but it was fairly clear to me as a new activist in free software, what I should have done, what we all should have done to actually liberate people from the oppression of people controlling our own computation. So the idea is that while you have a lot of pieces of proprietary software, which you do not control, and what you need to do is to replace every such a, every such a component of proprietary software with a free software equivalent. So we were using some local application, some game, and we needed to replace it with an equivalent free game. We were using some client server software, some mail, source, some mail client, some mail server, some IRC client, some IRC server. And what we needed to do to actually empower people and liberate people was to rewrite those pieces of software with free software equivalents. So it was difficult because it was a lot of stuff to be rewritten, but it was fairly clear. The plan was clear. And also, luckily, we also had, at the time, all the EV lifting was already in place. The GNU project had existed since quite, since quite a while. The Linux kernel existed, existed already and it was working. So someone else with shoulder larger than the, the shoulder I had at the time had already done a lot of work for me. And me, together with other free software activists, what I had to focus on was to rewrite proprietary application into equivalent free software application, possibly better. So it was clear, it wasn't hard, but it was fairly clear. And that's where I think the notion of a free software project comes from. So we, we, use, we use very often this term of a free software project, and I never ended up really thinking about that before a few years ago. And I think the reason why we call it free software project is that there is an objective. So there is a mission, ideally a time-limited one, and that mission is writing a replacement for a proprietary application using free software, which is as good, possibly better, than the original. And having a lot of free software projects around give rise to a lot of releases. So what we were doing a lot at the time, in the 90s, was to actually manually install software on our own machines. To be fair, we also had our lab was running some Red Hat machines. At the time, there weren't that many packages available, and uh, we had to fairly often install stuff by hand on the lab machines in our own directories, and also on our computers at home. And this is the procedure you all know very well. So you download a tarball, you run configure, you run make, you run make install. The first time I saw that, it was kind of a magic, magical recipe for me. Just follow these steps, and you will get some software to play with. 
Well, except that every single step could fail, of course. Well, uh, let's, let's keep aside for the moment the fact that the website might be down, but you run configure and you miss some software, you need to fetch it from somewhere else. You run make, you encounter some compilation, compilation problem, you run make install, maybe the path will clash, and so on and so forth. So the problem with this procedure for installing software we were using by hand is that you're essentially conflating roles. You're mixing together the role of software user, the role of system administrator, and the role of software developers. You need to have a little bit of all those skills together to be able to enjoy software. So in a sense, a free software which works like this is essentially a very elitist thing. It's only an elite which have all the needed skills who is able to enjoy the benefits of free software and is able to be in control of their own computation. And this is essentially the reason why distributions much earlier had been invented. Okay? So we all know very well here what distributions do. They sit in between software developers and software users and make it easy for you to actually use that software. We do uh, installer work, we create installers, we create package managers, we do all the integration work that make different pieces of software work well together. And we actually make life easy for final users. So for me, something that I started believing is that the, uh, the ultimate mission of free software distributions is, is to actually democratize free software, to enable users which do not have software development skills or do not have system administration skills, enable them to enjoy the benefit of free software. So we offer a very simple interface. We offer the equivalent of what these days are called app stores, in which with one click, you can just install some software and enjoy the benefit of that software, in particular of free software. So this is, for me, the historical mission of, of distributions. So later on, in 1998, our lab decided to switch to Debian. And I was really happy about that. We switched from Reda to Debian. And I look up about this project. I start learning about what this project does. And I find out that not only this project, Debian, was actually up to the mission of empowering users by making it easy for users to use free software. If you, if you read the original announcement of uh, Ian Murdoch announcing uh, the, the Debian project, we found this notion of being competitive with proprietary operating system, and it's really clear that the point is empowering users. And I, I end up reading about this project, and not only I found out that the mission they're up to is the mission I believe in, but I found out that the key intuition there is to make the project a community project. So not only the target are the users and empowering them, but also the way to reaching that objective is creating, fostering a community that will work together to that goal. So I got immediately hooked. I vividly remember the moment a colleague of mine, a student, explained to me the anatomy of a Debian source package, the fact that it was a .org.gz, the fact that it was a diff .gz with the difference with respect to upstream, and all those metadata, that was really thrilling for me from a technical point of view. So a few years later, I ended up uh, joining the ENM process. I was doing some OCaml development at the time. Uh, there were some libraries, OCaml libraries in Debian, others are missing, and decided, okay, so maybe I should help and create some libraries for, for the project as well. I went through ENM, and uh, there are a few things I've learned during ENM, and also in the subsequent 10 years or 15 years or so. So one thing I've learned in all these years in Debian is the importance of being principled. So Debian is a project that did not start from uh, only technical means, but also decided at some point that they needed some guidance, some clear guidance on what you should do technically and what you shouldn't. And an important document where we have distilled this notion are the DFSG. Okay? They've been free software guidelines, which have been very influential on the free software movement as a whole. They've been used as a basis for the open source definition, as you know. And what was very thrilling for me is that commitment that we had in Debian in keeping the main archive completely the FSG free, keep keeping it completely free software. This commitment is depicted here by those fearsome uh, character and his owner uh, on a couch, and it's mediating and uh, triggering the, the new queue, uh, supposedly. And the new queue is not necessarily the best way we could implement a system which triage all the software in the archive to ensure it is DFSG free, but it shows our commitment to actually only follow the guidelines that we have set for ourselves. That was really motivating for me. And the second thing I've learned, and which will come handy in a bit, is the importance of the legal knowledge and legal geeks in the free software movement. 
like it or not, free software as an ideal is philosophical mainly. But the, its main implementation is through the legal system. It's through copyright licenses. So to really, go, to really grok what's happening in free software in general and to understand what's, where the free software movement is going, figuring out and really understanding what's going on in the legal system is very important. And in Debian, we know that pretty well. That's a stumbling block for many people when joining the, the Debian project. It's something we insist people are at least basically familiar with. And that's pretty, um, a pretty characteristic of the Debian project. So in the end, what I've learned is that in this quest that I feel very much myself against the oppression of someone else controlling your own computation, law, if you act around it smartly, can be a very useful ally, a very useful device to liberate users. Uh, time passes. There was supposed to be an image here, which for some reason disappeared. And we might argue that these days we have achieved a lot since that moment. If I look around the industry, or in general, if I look around computing as people are doing that, well, free software is a little bit everywhere. In the industry, it is, there are some stats that claim that essentially every single software product you find on the market has a little, in, inside of it at least a little bit of free software code. And if you look at all the different application stacks we have, from web servers to education to clients to smartphone, you find a lot of free software, uh, free software infrastructure that are everywhere. Okay, so these are just some stats I figured out in the, in the recent years. And uh, for instance, if we look at the, one of the key target markets for Debian, that of servers, we'll find now that one website uh, over 10 on the internet in, the, in general, it's running Debian. If we include also some of our most popular derivatives, such as Ubuntu, we'll find that more than 20% of the website are running something which comes from our own work. And some of the uh, recent hype on free software is coming from, uh, has been coming from the Snowden revelation and most people are starting to be concerned about what the software they're using is doing, and it's turning to see free software, and it's turning to stuff like Tails, which is heavily Debian-based, to actually see in which way we can help them foster their own security. Okay? So in some sense, we have achieved a lot. In, a very, in, a, in everything we do in computing, there is a little bit of what we have done in free software, and also a little bit of what we have done in Debian. And this is pretty impressive for me. It's a, we are in a place where I wouldn't have dreamed being when I started in 1997. That's really impressive. On the other hand, there are some reasons of concerns, and this is the, the main thought I wanted to share with you. Uh, and there are some technical reasons which we discuss often in free software circles, like the fact that, okay, but most of these platforms are not 100% are not free software. If you look at smartphones, smartphones, for instance, you will find a lot of non-free code every here and there. And the point can be made that either you have full control over your own computation or you're not in control at all. Because if your software stack is a single layer which is controlled by someone else and is mediating all your communication, well, maybe you're not so sure that you're the real owner and the real controller of your own device. And that's absolutely a fair point. We can be made some more technical points about, for instance, non-free JavaScript. More and more of our computations are happening in our browsers, and they're happening through code which is delivered to our browser by uh, remote servers, and those code is not free at all. And I absolutely agree with that, but the point I want to focus on for today is actually what we call the cloud. Okay, so every, all my images are, are gone. Oh, I had a very nice image there, sorry. Uh, so, the, the, the remaining point, and this is my main reason of concern, is what is being called the cloud. Let, allow me to be a bit generic here for a moment. I know there are very different parts in what we call the cloud, and we'll be more specific in all of them in a bit. But for now, I want to focus on the common trend that the cloud is bringing to computing these days. So computing today, for most people, is not much different from the kind of computing I was doing 15 years ago. Okay. That's the kind of computing that we do on very different hardware, so we have way more smartphones, way more tablets than in the past, and that's true. That the kind of activities we do, producing content, consuming content, is very similar. The big difference is the kind of technological stack we are using and where the computation are happening. So for most people today, the kind of office suite we use is no longer a software which is installed on your machine, but it is Google Docs. 
I'm an academic myself. I'm very often forced to use some Google Docs application to work with others. Otherwise, I'm free not to work with them. Okay, because it's a technological choice which has been made by someone else. For many people, email, as you know, just means Gmail. Okay, and all, the, uh, all our emails, even if we're not using Gmail ourselves, are passing through some Gmail servers. Asynchronous, asynchronous communication still exists, but is very often mediated to software like Skype or Gtalk, and so on and so forth. We have seen this list very often. Okay? Consuming content, there as well, we are still doing gaming, we are still doing browsing, but it's often mediated by platforms which are far away from us and just stream content to us. Or, in the specific case of web browsing, they are more and more often hosted by a very few hosters in the world, which we often refer to a wallet garden, that can do whatever they want with our content. Okay? So, the point here is not demonizing those services. People are using those services because they are convenient. And there is a lot of network effect going on that makes it easy for other people to just start using those services. So it's really not the point of demonizing those services. The point here is observing that interesting computations that we are doing as, a final, as, our, as our job, as our, as our life, are no longer happening on our machines, but are happening on other machines which are far away from us and which are not under our direct control. In this context, for me, I confess, what actually is the road to software freedom and to control, to enable people to control their own computation, is no longer clear. It's no longer enough to say, well, we just need to rewrite Google or Facebook or Twitter in free software. That's not enough, because even if you do that, you have the problem that when you are using a server, you don't know if the code it is running is the one they claim it is running, so that's a very difficult problem to solve. And even if it were the case, well, where do you deploy yourself a Google-like architecture or a Facebook-like architecture? You simply can't, okay? So it's no longer enough to just say, we just need to do some software development, and we just need to make it better than the alternative. There is a real tricky combination between software development and software deployment, which is not easy to see how to fix it. At least for me, it's, it's sort of very, in a very muddy water. So what about distros? So we are distro people. We are doing one of the most popular distros in existence. So are we winning or are we losing in this situation? How are we doing in terms of, of uh, our efforts? So in a sense, we are very much winning. A lot of our work is being used to deploy those infrastructures. A lot of the infrastructure of the big companies are deployed on top of free software, if not directly on top of our very own systems, maybe modified here and there where they need to, to make things better, as it is their own right, given it's all free software. Okay? So in that sense, we're winning. We're increasing market share. We're, using, we're being used a lot to make infrastructure. But we're also losing in the sense that we are really not empowering users to be in control of their own computations. Okay? If our final users are the sysadmin that are running those infrastructure, for them we are doing great. We are making them be sure that they are in control of their own infrastructure. But for the final users of those services, we are really not empowering them at the moment. So what I call the free software dark ages, which is an expression which I actually borrowed from, from Bradley Kuhn, and I find, find it quite inspiring, is a situation in which we win on the end user market. So every single device out there in the end of people, desktop, laptop, even smartphones, where right now we are not doing very well, all of this is running free software. All of that is running Debian. Okay? So total world domination, as we were talking about a long time ago. But all interesting computations, all the final user application, which has been used to bring on with your digital life are no longer happening on your devices, are happening far away from you, on computer you do not control, sometimes with free software, sometimes with non-free software, but in any case, outside your own control. So in a sense, this is very worrisome for me because we have this euphoria of saying we are really popular. Okay? We are winning the war, the war. We were using a lot of this uh, uh, war-like terminology uh, when I started. But the war that we are winning is, seems to be coming increasingly pointless, because it's not being useful to actually empower users to be in control of their own computation. To make things worse, there seems to be some, some cultural problems. That might be just you know, a perception of mine, maybe I'm being too pessimistic, but it seems to me that 
as developer communities, as hacker communities, we are becoming way more lenient, way more lax about the lack of control on the tools and on the infrastructure we use to make free software. More and more often, we see free software developed on uh, non-free infrastructure, meaning infrastructure which are built using non-free software and which are anyhow centralized in the end of a few hosters. Okay? And we, the new generation of developer which is coming up seems to be totally fine with that. So I'm not going to argue this point in much detail. There is a great essay by Mako that I encourage all of you to read. Free software needs free tools, which actually make a couple of points. One is that by using non-free software to make free software, we are sending out a very bad message. We are telling to the world that free software is good for you. That's why we are developing it. But it's not good for us because we are using non-free tool to make it. So that's a kind of a catch-22 in our advertising message. But it's also making the software we are creating indirectly less free. Because if the favorite way to contribute to that free software is using some non-free infrastructure or some non-free tools, where indirectly we are making people that only want to use free software less apt to contribute to that software. So really recommended reading that essay. But also technically, we are going back to a sort of a cage problem, which is also a problem which has been called the problem of the bug that no one can fix by the FSF, I think. And essentially, we're creating software stacks in which some part of it is entirely free software that we can debug, and some other parts are non-free software or anyhow software run by someone else. So we have lost the ability to debug the full stack. When I was uh, starting to learn programming, this this idea that I could debug everything from the end user I was writing myself for an assignment down to the kernel level was just exciting for me. And we seem to be losing sight of this a little bit. As a second cultural problem, we seem to be losing sight of how much help we could get from the legal system and from new legal solutions that we might be in need of finding. An example of that is the post-open source software POS debate, which some of you might have run into. And that's a debate which actually observed that the new generation of free software developers actually don't care about licenses. They just want to kick out their code, just put it on GitHub, not declaring a license at all, and they're just fine with that. Okay? So they want to, be, have to, to have the hassle of deciding, first of all, a license, second of all, also some governance model for their projects. They just want to be hacking and, doing, and not caring about those uh, annoying details. Uh, this could be interpretedly, interpreted in positive ways, like says that we want the, uh, the right to, to work on the code and to do whatever we want with that by default. We do not want to be explicit in which kind of rights we give, and that's a very positive interpretation of this phenomenon. But in the end, for now, it is creating a huge bunch of code that we could not use as free software yet. For instance, we cannot include in Debian something that does not have a license at all. Okay? A second example is the debate about the non-freeness of AGPL. If you look up the history, of, uh, of free software. There's an argument that the GPL itself is not free. It's an argument that was being used 20 years ago when the battle between copyleft and liberalizing was very high, was very harsh, and it's just recurring again. So maybe for some syntactical interpretation of our own guidelines, we could make the point that something like the GPL is not free, maybe. But the point is that the way we distribute software to final user is really changing. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, the main way to enable some user to use a piece of software was actually to make a copy of that software and give it to him or to her via the network or on some media. And that, was conveying, that kind of conveying software is clearly distribution. And that kind of activity used to trigger some sort of license clauses. These days, the software is no longer being distributed that way, in large parts. It's being used over the net, and something like the GPL is the equivalent of triggering some licensing condition via the main way of distributing, of giving access to some software. So I want to enter in details of this debate. Those are just examples. For me, they are examples of the fact that we are kind of losing faith in how much the legal system and free software are intertwined. And this actually mixes very badly with the situation in which users are losing control because computations are moving away from that. I think this situation, in general, is not going to fix themselves, and we as distribution people have a role to play in, in fixing it. So what could be our role for Debian in all this computing situation we have these days? So 
The common trend in the so-called cloud seems to be that computations are moving away from user devices. And we cannot just say, well, just don't use anything cloudy, because it is convenient. People will want to use that. We need to do something different. So as distribution people, we could do a lot, I think. And I have a couple of thoughts to share with you that are different depending on the, um, the, the so-called service model of the cloud. So one of the first service model of the cloud you might have heard about is infrastructure as a service, where essentially you have servers that give virtual machines to people and essentially you, can, you get to administer your own machine, which is a virtual machine, on a virtual machine server controlled by someone else. This is potentially very good for people because it is lowering the barrier you need to have your own server. When I first set up my own server with friends in, uh, at the end of the 90s, well, we had to buy some machine to find someone kind enough to host it, paying the hosting fees and so on and so forth, and it was something that was by far not at all accessible to the random user. These days, a lot of people can simply go to some virtual machine provider, rent a virtual machine with one click button, and they have their own machine to administer. Maybe they don't have the skill to administer, to administer it, that's a different problem, but we are definitely lowering the barrier to access to have your own server and do your own remote computations. So as Debian, we are doing pretty well in this area, I think. We are offering technologies like OpenStack and other competitors of OpenStack, which are, seems to be the market lead on that market, which are entirely free software. But I think we should be investing more in offering a trivial deployment experience for Debian users. We should make trivial for people to have their own virtual machine servers. If they are not computer geeks, they should be able to flock together friends which have software system administration ability and have their own local IAAS and have their own virtual machine without having to rely on big hoster provider that offer virtual machines to everyone in the world. This is, would be a, a great step toward autonomy. So as Debian, what is the best deployment experience we can offer for people that want to set up their own virtual machine servers? Then there is another service model which is called PaaS, Platform as a Service. This is a kind of service model in which essentially you have hosters of application engines. You develop an application targeting specific application engine, and uh, sorry, application servers. So you target specific application servers. An example of this is a Google App Engine. Okay, and I think in some sense this service model of the cloud is mostly orthogonal to what we do as a distribution, because either you are using a full-fledged distribution and you do your own system administration, or you are developing an application for a specific application server and you rely on someone else to do that administration. So yes, I think that's mostly orthogonal to what we do, but might also be a symptom that there is a reject from the application developer community, a reject from the way they, need, they can target distributions like Debian. So if it is very difficult to have your own application running properly on Debian, because we have old software, because we change libraries, because we do not accept multiple copies of the same libraries, and so on and so forth, if it is too difficult for application developers to target Debian, they might be more and more tempted to target application servers like PAAS. So there might be something we could do this here, like finding better synergies between containerization technology, we have some work being done in Debian, and the way we usually develop some, uh, we usually maintain a distribution. There might be something we could do about this here. Oh, and I didn't mention this, but I have no, hands, no specific answer to give to you, just a train of thoughts that I wanted to share with you and what we could do to improve the situation. And the final service model we have in the cloud, which is, I think, uh, worrisome from the point of view of user, of, user experience, of user control is SAAS, software as a service. There, essentially, you use your own device, your own computer, only as a thin client and rely entirely on a remote server to do your own computation. So we are back to the mainframe thin client distinction of the early days of computing. And here, there is a lot we could do, I think, but also a lot we could not do. Here, most of the work should come from upstreams. We need better free software and federated replacement for popular centralized and proprietary applications in which users can participate in some kind of network by using their own node, okay? And this is work that should not come from distribution itself. It should really come from application developers upstream. But still, there are, still, there are useful things we could do here. So we already have a lot of building blocks. 
We have stuff like OwnCloud, GitAnnex, Media Gobling, Pub.io, we have Yassi. We have a lot of good building blocks. Most of them are not yet up to par with the uh, centralized proprietary equivalent, but I'm confident we could get there. What we lack is the equivalent ease of deployment of these services on user machines. In some sense, if we have democratized the installation of software 20 years ago with distributions, well, these days, to face the challenge of control of our own computation, we need to make it as easy as using a package manager to install your own nodes using those applications. Ideally, everyone in the world without nothing more than basic computing skills or computer user skill should be able to have its own machine at home doing some anonymous browsing, doing some mail handling, doing web hosting, doing storage calendar, doing encrypted peer-to-peer -to -peer backup, and so on and so forth. I'm maintaining my own mail server, and it is a huge of work. I struggle myself to keep up with the need of knowledge and of uh, surveillance that I need to make to my own mail server to be able to, uh, to run it properly, and I get blacklisted from time to time from big providers, and it's a pain. It's something that no one, without having at least some basic system administration ability, could do properly. This is the thing we need, the, the, nut we need, the nut we need to crack. We need to empower everyone out there to have its own computer with its own node of those services. And of course, you are all thinking at the Freedom Box now. And that's a great example of a project who wants to tackle precisely that problem. It is a pro project that's been announced by Eben Moglen a few years ago at a DebConf, if my memory serves me well. It's heavily based on, on Debian, and it's doing exactly that. But my question, from the Debian point of view, is maybe this project should not only be a spin-off of Debian, should not only be a, der a, derived dist a derivative distribution of Debian. Maybe we should think of making something like this as first-class citizen in Debian. I don't know exactly what that means yet. It's something we could think about having the main administration interface for Debian, something that targets these specific scenarios. We could generalize that. We do not need to target only specific plug devices, because people at home might have desktop computers, might have media center. They might want to have something like the Freedom Box at home and collaborate with others immediately. My point here is that if our mission back in the days was to democratize free software by making it easier to install software on your machine, well, today our mission is democratize free software by making it trivial to install some node of some federation of free services on your machine. And another thing we could do, and this is the last one for me today, is to step, step in the free service debate. When I started looking up these arguments a few years back, I was surprised by the fact that it's still not clear what does it mean to be a free service. Okay? When I started working on free software 15 years ago, it was fairly clear what does free software mean. Sure, there was some ter terminology debate between free software and open source, which still exists today, but the basic freedoms, the basic rights that you should have to call something free and open source was fairly clear. That kind of intellectual debate had already happened at the time. Today, where the problem of computations moving away from individual user is raging, there is no clear consensus on that matter. There is some great work. For instance, there is the Franklin Street Statement on Free Network Service. I think that's the full title, dating back to 2008, that's six years ago, in which you find a lot of very useful recommendation for users, for software developers, and for system administrators to make sure that you maximize your control over your own computation on the network, but they take no, issue, no, no stance on what does it mean to be a free service. Okay? Is it enough to have something which is free? You, do you need more in the specific license? There are some recommendations on that point, but still there are no clear answers to this question. Sorry. Um, there is another work by RMS 2010 about software as a service, or service as a software substitute, as he calls it. And here, essentially, what you have is a main recommendation about don't you, not using software as a service at all. Essentially, there is a recommendation of doing your own computation on your own machines. I think that might be, well, that's generally a good recommendation, but it's not going to scale. 
is not going to be enough, in my opinion, to convince people not to use very convenient services. I think we need more gradual and blurry lines saying, encouraging people to keep computation closer to them, to rely on federation of friends, of people, to do computation together, and we, as distribution people, could make it easier for them to do so. And then there is another work, which is network services aren't free or non-free, which is a couple of years later, still by RMS, which essentially try to walk the fine line between what's the difference between a pure service, so a service that just, for instance, convey messages, as opposed to a service which does computation that could have been done instead on your machine. And that's a very fine line to work. It's very difficult to stay there. And what we might need there is a, uh, is a stronger position, actually, in which you try to replace everything which is centralized with federated equivalent and say that we, as free software people, as distribution people, should work in that direction. So what we could do in Debian? Well, I think we should try to step in this debate. Surprisingly for me, we still have no clear answer to what does it mean to be a free service today. And we have quite a bit of experience in Debian in leading debates in the area of free software. We have created the EFSG, which has been used as an example for many other communities. We have participated in the GPLv3 discussion, for instance. Our decisions in terms of free license are looked upon, are looked up by other projects. So we might have a, uh, the authority and the reputation to step in these debates, and we also have a lot of technical knowledge in the area. So being a, free so a distribution committed to free software, we know a thing or two not only about software freedom, but also about how you deploy software. Okay? How difficult it is and how difficult it should be for people to deploy free software. So I think we are in a, just the sweet spot to actually enter this debate with the needed authority and make a contribution to actually help people realize what does it mean today to use a free service. So the concluding question I have for you is, so what's Debian take today on liberating users? Would we... Would we be happy enough to have Debian on every machine in the world if people are using completely remote services? And if we were not, well, what should we do? What should we be working on to change that future, which seems very much the future that we have at hand? So, yeah, pictures are gone. So there was a cloudy network, cloudy, uh, a cloud, or a rainy cloud on the left. There was Debian here and a uh, sun here. So. Latex, Beamer, or Tix, or something is playing tricks on me. So that's all I have for you. I hope you have I've given you some food for thought for this week. And uh, if you have any questions or comments or in these topics, I'm very much happy to hear about that. Thanks a lot. There seems to be a mic which is floating around down there. He oh. talked quite a lot and quite brilliantly about uh, what uh, cloud computing uh, buzzwords mean for free software. But I think one important battle that we're actually losing is for hearts and minds of people. Why is it that young developers or newcomers to free software don't care about uh, software being free? Uh, why don't they care about non -free, using non-free tools? Why don't they care about uh, which licenses they declare for the software, if any licenses at all, and so on? You mentioned that problem, but what do we do about it? Do you have any ideas? Well, a friend of mine, when asked a similar question, I think once answered, well, what could they say more than all oh, those young kids? So I don't know, maybe it's our fault. Maybe we have failed as a, as a generation to convey the importance that being in control of our own computation had. Or maybe it's just that the public that is open to coding and hacking is much larger than in the past, so we are reaching out to other communities. And it's very good for them to be coding, because I think every citizen in the world needs to have some basic knowledge of coding to understand what's happening in the world. But maybe they just have different mission than we had in the past. So, you, very good question. I don't have a very good answer, sorry. <laughs> Aaron? Uh, hello. 
Sorry, is this? It's good. Okay. Uh, so I thank you so much for the wonderful talk, and I, I think it's great to talk about these political issues. And I see there's a a challenge between the sort of very individual focus of each person being able to use their own computer as they wish, which has its own values, but there's a, a different sort of value that relates to power structures in general. So we're talking about not just how free is each individual person, but whether an entity like Twitter or Google or Facebook or some of these other services is a very powerful entity that has power over the majority of us who use their services. And so I wonder if, uh, and I'd like your thoughts on, on thinking about it less as a, is this software free, but about uh, who is in power in the community. And so in a, a democratic sense, you could have uh, the community that builds the tools together has governance structures or has mechanisms for handling power that make the power more bottom up and more democratic. And maybe that's as or more important than the technical status of each individual user. Yeah, so as a concerned citizen and also as a political activist, I very much share your concern. I think we need to focus on what it's at end reach for us as geeks in this circle and have this kind of discussion in different circles. So as someone who is active in politics, I very much try, and as a geek, I very much try to actually explain to politicians and to activists the role of what we're doing here in very technical ways and the impact that it has on politics in general. And I think Biela in the talk later on this evening might have a thing or two to say about that as well. So from our part, I need, we need to understand that in some sense, even if we advance a lot the status quo of user control over technology that we had 30 years ago, we have also started to lag behind in many other areas. Something that I wanted to mention before, but I failed to do so, is that when I were doing my computing in the 90s, a lot of computation were mediated by clearly defined protocols. So we had RFC, RFCs or equivalent documents by other organizations which were like clearly marked paths to how to collaborate technically on the internet and how to make software talk together. In a sense, that culture of interoperability of protocols has actually lag started lagging behind a lot with respect to popular technology. So stuff like social networks, most of them, except the, the good ones that free software guys are trying to, to build, like pump.io, like Diaspora, well, all of those, stuff, those technologies started up without any kind of interoperability in, in mind. So technically, I think we, should, we need to push against, again on the direction of interoperability of protocols, and that's a technical contribution that we could do that will have an impact. You know, code is law, as uh, Leslie was saying, and that would have a technical impact on the power structure you mentioned. That's that my thought on this matter. So I have a, an answer, or bit oh, of a, hello, yes, hello. I have an answer, or sort of an answer to the, to the previous Please. question. Um, so this is, of course, the heart of the difference between free software and open source. The difference between free software and open source isn't nothing at all, and it's not about licenses. It's about goals and aims. And over the past decades, those, you know, many of us have chosen not to pick a fight with open source people just for an easy life. And you know, it, it, it's always easier to have somebody who might share some of your goals and, and to, to be able to collaborate with them. But less and less is it becoming the case that the goals of people who are doing open source are the same as the goals of people doing free software. Um, you can see that very clearly in the responses from people like Google to things like the AGPL. Um, and there, there are a lot of examples. So one of the things that we can do to try and bring some of the new crop of developers along with us is to actually make a bit more of a fuss about, you know, let, let's not, you know, come over all Stallman about that. Stallman, Stallman is, is not the best PR guy, but I think De De Debian can do a lot better than he can, and we've probably got a lot more credibility, and individually we have as well. And what we need to do is we need to 
explain our vision to those new developers who mostly are just being, you know, they, they see a, an open source marketing machine and we're something different. Thanks. So does not need to be a question and answer. So if you have comments, feel free. So I think we're running short of time and we need to do okay. one more question. So maybe one last or Stefano, one last or we can. Okay. One last question or comment. Uh, just a, a quick comment, if I may. You talked about, you know, federated services and Facebook and Dropbox and that sort of thing. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I think maybe the, the issue here is, is perhaps less about federated services, but it's about identity. You know, if I have my own Dropbox alike and you have your own Dropbox alike, the problem is not necessarily that the two couldn't talk to each other, but we have no way of negotiating that sort of identity authentication access kind of problem. And I think maybe part of the answer to your question is, can we come up with some way of allowing federated identity management for people in general rather than just us, say? So I think this is very much related to what I uh, answering before to Haran. In the sense, yes, we could. We have shown in the past that we can come up with very uh, smart protocols that allow people to technically interoperate over the net, but we are we're coming too late for that. So those big entities, which now have the power to attract a lot of users to them, developed before those standards that we could have used to make smaller entities interoperate could have been put in place. So yes, I agree with you. There is technical work to be done, but in some sense we are, we are late in doing that work. And the question now is not only how could we do the technical work that allows to have smaller entities that interoperate for authentication or for everything else, and also how do we migrate from the status quo to the ideal world that would be possible if those standards existed in the first place. So in a sense, we, I think we are a bit late and now we have twice the work to be done before reaching the optimal and more federated situation which I think would solve the problem. So thanks a lot.